I'm Brandon Amoroso, and this is the D2Z Podcast, building and growing your business from a Gen Z perspective. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to D2Z, a podcast about using the Gen Z mindset to grow your business. I'm Gen Z entrepreneur Brandon Amoroso, founder and president of Retention as a Service Agency, Electric. And today I'm talking with Kevin Klein. Uh, director of agencies over at uh, Recharge, one of our closest partners and uh, who we're not only working with on the electric side, but also on the drinks app side and powering subscription commerce for uh, alcohol merchants on on Shopify. So thanks for coming on the show, Kevin. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Well, before we dive into some of the topics that I want to cover today, can you give everybody just a quick sort of background TLDR on, on yourself? Yeah, uh, thank you. Thanks uh, for the the drinks team for having me here. Um, really excited to, to join the podcast. So um, yeah, so my name is Kevin Klein. I'm the director of agency partners uh, at Recharge. Uh, if you're not familiar with Recharge, we are a uh, recurring payments and retention optimization platform uh, that integrates with Shopify and Big Commerce. Uh, and my role here is uh, really focused on partnering up with um, d- commerce first digital agencies. Uh, that are out there essentially doing what uh, what Brandon's team is, is focused on, on the idea of retention, um, doing innovative things on the Shopify platform uh, or other and other e-commerce platforms um, to help their merchants grow. And prior to that, I was uh, I was in a different world. I wasn't in the, uh, the, sh- the, the payments world. I was in the shipping world working at a, um, an e-commerce uh, uh, shipping company called ShipStation. What's more fun? I really think payments is is where it's at. Uh, payments, yeah, p- payments is interesting. It's not that I don't have a love for for logistics. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, that what's interesting is that um, the the customer journey really sort of starts right. Uh, it starts with the payment process, right? Like it really comes to that space where um, someone's at a decision point um, and whether or not they're going to buy, um, and that really is sort of lifeblood of the of the e-commerce merchant themselves. Um, shipping is great, but it's really more how you scale versus um, versus how you're actually like what's growing and what's paying the bills and really exciting about e-commerce, which is getting sales and, and growing your business. Got it. Yeah. I think I've always been fascinated by that side of things, but I've never wanted to actually like get into it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but and there's the, something about going into a warehouse where you see like lots and lots of boxes. It's an amazing thing to see, right? It's amazing to see yeah. The labels coming out and some of the automations and processes, but um, but there is something like magical about like a really smooth and frictionless um, payment process that really like just excites me. Well, it just reminds me more and more how customer experience and retention touches so many different components of a business, and so you can't just focus on one area and not have the others. Like you could have all the email and SMS communications in the world, but if you have like a crappy returns experience or you don't have a uh, really like streamlined uh, fulfillment operation on your end, you're going to end up with a negative customer experience and they're just not going to come back. And I think like the Shopify additions report that they released yesterday, there's a lot of really cool stuff around um, the fulfillment side and how much of it is real versus like, oh, it's going to happen eventually. I, I, I think I'm still trying to work through, but things like showing the delivery time window in the checkout process, like that increases conversion rate. So as a brand, even if you're not able to do like the three hour Amazon shipping or whatever the hell it is now, um, yeah. still communicate it. And then that'll help with uh, not only increasing conversion rate, but then mitigate like customer service tickets. So it all really connects together. Yeah. I always thought about it. Um, I almost thought about e-commerce in like two very like specific sort of mindsets. Um, this even comes from when I was in the logistics size, but there's like inspiration to order this concept of like, I'm interested, I've seen an ad or like I'm following someone on YouTube, um, which, and I want to buy the product of the, the hero or whatever and from this quasi media company, um, then for to sort of like order to delight, right? And I think for a long time in commerce, those two experiences were sort of like siloed. It was like, hey, create this really great experience up to the point of purchase and then p- pass that. Um, how do I get communicated my order? But now we're seeing sort of that um, journey more holistically. And you're seeing sort of shipping coming in, those, those questions about how am I going to get my item, um, how fast am I going to get my item, transparency on, um, on when I get my item sort of come further up into the buying cycle. 
Uh, and I think that's a good thing because it, to your point, it really like increases conversion and it does create a better customer experience. There's continuity across, um, not only payments, shippings, but even like something as simple as like, how much am I going to pay in tax on this product? Right. Is really becoming like this whole experience. I think merchants are waking up to that reality that they can't just be good at one aspect of them. They have to be good at all of them all at once, which is quite terrifying for a lot of merchants right you know they, they yeah. really want to be able to like optimize every aspect of the e-commerce journey and and to be quite honest that's what merch, uh, the customers are expecting now yeah i it was crazy to me um we had a brand that would ship a bunch of products internationally uh, to customers and they would collect the duties upon delivery like from the customer and so there was very little communication if any to the customer ordering from like Italy or Poland or whatever that like, Hey, you're actually this order it might look like a hundred dollars, but when you get it, you're going to have to pay another 50 to the person delivering it to you. Otherwise it's going to get returned to sender. So like stuff like that is just an awful customer experience, obviously. Um, and now a lot of these technology updates and uh, their partnership with globally and stuff like it's mitigating that and making it possible at least for brands to, to not sort of shoot themselves in the foot with stuff like that. Yeah. And like customers tolerance for that is just gone. Right. <laughs> like they, they just don't, you know, like the last, you know, best experience they've had is now the new benchmark for, for their sort of expectations online. Uh, and so when stuff like that happens or they don't get, you know, a tracking email on time or they hit the tracking email link and it's broken or the payment takes, even if the payment takes too long, I mean, there's, there's so much nuance there, but if any of those things break, um, or any of those things have friction, um, they're just gone. Uh, and yeah. they may not come back, right? And I think with with this new reality of, hey, it takes a lot to get a customer to like come in and purchase something. Um, you're spending money on ads, you're spending money on, um, as, as a merchant, you're spending money on a lot of things, right? Optimization. To have them come in and then bounce um, or not come back, or maybe they had a bad experience. Yeah, they got their item, but it wasn't as, you know, the experience was terrible. Um, is a real is a real detriment for for merchants um, as they're really sort of facing these rising costs of acquisition. Yeah, so I guess given the rising cost of acquisition and your role and position at, at Recharge, what are some of the things that you're focused on this year um, with like your agency partners and, and just in general, based off of that? Well, the the, the word I, that keeps coming up. Um, I think is is retention, right? Is this concept of you know how do I get more lifetime value or LTV out of um, out of every customer that comes through my my door? Um, but then also like optimizing the customers that I've already had um, and going back to them and and getting them to buy again. Uh, you know, I can go spend. You know, the, the stat I heard the other day is I can go spend thirty to forty dollars to go get a new customer, or I can spend ten dollars to get an existing one to to buy again. Um, so a lot of what I'm focusing on uh, with our partners is really like cracking the formula around retention. Um, I think there are things that we know um, within the recharge platform that, that have a direct result on LTV. Um, for example, uh, SMS, which is something that comes up, this idea of uh, transactional SMS specifically. Um, the idea that if you use SMS and give customers flexibility in the way that they are allowed to like select their subscription, there's a marginal effect on, um, on, on LTV. In fact, it's like 30% higher, right? If you use SMS. Mm -hmm. So, um, but what, what's fascinating with our partners is I think recharges is one piece of the component of an overall tech stack. And so how we interact with, um, you know, top grade Shopify, um, ESPs, for example, the likes of Clavio. Um, the likes of other of membership of loyalty, uh, all of these different apps that might be part of a tech stack. How do they all work together um, to boil up to one or two metrics that really make a difference to a merchant? Um, and those metrics are AOV, average order value, and uh, LTV, lifetime value. Mm -hmm. And how do, where does that prioritization come from in terms of um, tech partners that you're you're focused on? Is are you like tracking internally? These are the number of overlaps that we have like we've got x per, x percent of recharge merchants are using clavio for example um, yeah not not particularly maybe not down to like that level i mean certainly we know how many people are are using our our integrations um but i think what we look at more is we sort of look to our partners to to optimize that with us um and 
and give us feedback on where there are places to optimize, like from an A-B testing standpoint or from, um, from like a functionality standpoint. Like the example I like to give, there's a great case study uh, on our website about for, for customer called Who Gives a Crap? One of the best, like great, great companies that are out there in terms of like, and if you, if you, don't, if you haven't guessed by now, they, they sell toilet paper, right? And there's a great story on there about how they sort of like used recharge in conjunction with the likes of Clavio um, to give their customers more options, right? Hitting them at the right times, um, hitting them with the right emails at the at the optimal point, um, giving them more options around um, actions, like quick actions on how to uh, adjust um, or pause or maybe potentially skip their subscription. Um, and then we take real we take note of like what things directly correlate to um, to lifetime value. Uh, and then we ask our partners to do the same thing, right? So we say like, okay, if you're gonna add a third variable to that, um, like maybe a reviews platform or something to that effect or a loyalty platform. Like how does how does that integration in conjunction with this um, with this other integration um, correlate directly? So it is a lot of like trial and error and A/B testing. Um, but I know they're they're partners just like you guys that are like doing that every day and kind of taking a look at like where those touch points and where they're actually impacting um, overall sort of lifetime value for a merchant. Mm -hmm. and I guess how as a part of the the agency um, partner program and sort of the the evolution of it since since your time with with recharge, it feels like there's becoming more and more of an overlap, uh, just partnerships in general, like technology and agency are sort of intertwined because all the agencies have their own technology partners as well. Um, and then they all sort of like come together versus being these separate silos. Yeah, I I couldn't agree more. I, I have this line, and I, some people roll their eyes at it, but I I think that, <laughs> you know it's it's. Uh, but I I really do believe this that that agencies are laboratories of innovation and e-commerce, right? I honestly think that they um, they have more visibility on uh, on what's going on from a more holistic view than than this than than an individual SaaS application ever could, right? They see sort of the big picture, uh, and I think some of the best ideas in terms of like what functionality we needed or like feedback on, on features as we roll them out with recharge have come from, from our agency partners. Um, it's how recharge goes to market. And it's why we work so closely with them because they really do speak directly to the merchant. It's not that we're not speaking directly to the merchant, but they're speaking to the merchant about their entire business, right. And all the apps they might be using and how they work with one another. Um, so some of the, some of the greatest things I've seen on, on the recharge platform have been customizations um, or like private applications that are really unique um, or built by an agency, right? Mm -hmm. um, we recently launched, I think that was uh, in the summer of last year, um, some concepts around bundles, right? So we launched a bundles product. Uh, bundling wasn't necessarily like new to Recharge. So we'd had agency partners who had built out some, some fantastic customized uh, bundling functionality, but it was so overwhelmingly adopted and... Um, and well received by the merchants who had ha, had been the benefit of those customizations that the decision was made that we should productize it and come out with um, something that was more out of the box, right? Because it was, yeah. it was well received. So I think that's a good example of where building out a platform and then sort of letting the agencies go out and build out the things they want to build on it. And then, um, and then sort of leaning into the, the features and, and apps that they make on top of that platform is a winning strategy. Yeah, I, I've never really thought of it as a as a breeding ground for innovation, but I guess that does make a lot of sense because of the vast um, sort of amount of exposure that we're getting to different industries and different types of companies. But the where I think it really works well is where um, we can be sort of boots on the ground in the beta programs and testing it with new partners. But when metrics like up to 30% increase in LTV, if you adopt recharge SMS, like that's getting pulled from your guys's massive set of data across the tens of thousands or whatever number it is of merchants that you're powering. And yeah. so we don't have that scale that you do in terms of getting that sort of data. But because of the close partnership, we're like, hey, Brandon and Electric team, this is what we're seeing on our end. And so then we're like, well, shit, we're going to roll it out to everybody now across our client base and still we'll, we'll prove it out with them individually. But those insights getting fed into us are super valuable as well from the agency partner team. 
Yeah, I, I think it's it is about partnership, right? We do have more data, um, but we don't necessarily have all the visibility or um, or use cases that might possibly come up, right? And so I think the way that Recharge has cons- has gone to market has been with our agency partners. And you know, if you if you look at the history of Recharge, they we really focused on building out APIs. Uh, that's really like where we put our bread and butter is like building out a platform. Um, or if you think of it as like a baseline where um, our partners like Electric can go in and say, well, um, this use case uh, doesn't exist natively, but we can build it on top of the API. Uh, and, and if we see that as a pattern consistently coming up, then it's something that we would lean into and, and build, um, you know, so it's easier for agencies to deploy it, um, you know, in a shorter amount of time so they can have faster time to value for their merchants. So um, recognizing that uh, and, and going to market in that way is, is very much how we, we do business. And that's that's how we're approaching bundles. Uh, even our bundles platform, pretty powerful out of the box, but it's still customizable, right? It's still uh, it's still configurable from a um, from an agency standpoint, as is our memberships product right, that's coming out. Um, that's going to be a very... It's a, it's a platform. We sort of say, hey, this is how we envision memberships. Um, not only is it like something out of the box, but we also give you the SDKs to be able to go out and customize it. Uh, and that's how we're going to continue to go to, to market, I think, is, is continuing to lean into our agencies for that innovation as it comes out. Yeah, well, it's like the ease of use and then you're able to extend upon it. Um, so I think it's a great way to allow product adoption across a wide like array of your merchants as well. And then as they grow and scale, then maybe they start working with an agency to extend the functionality of what's out of the box with, with free charge, which is what we see a lot, but the use cases is a big thing. And that's what, that's one of the, the best things that's come out of um, doing the newsletter once a week is looking at all the updates that are coming from the tech partners, but providing that um, sort of more practical, here's how you should be thinking about how you could deploy or test this into your own Shopify website. And um, there's a lot of times some of that context is provided by the tech partner, but like we really try and take it to the next level in terms of this is how we're going to deploy it at Electric and surface those learnings across the, the word. And, and that's why we're leaning into SDKs, because I mean, I think that's the the reality is that like just handing a partner and going, here's our API documentation just isn't enough anymore. I think it's you need to come out and say, like, this is our this is how we conceive uh, or we perceive um, how this product should work um, as a base, as like a starting point, um, knowing that merchants are going to want that customizability. Um, and the the agency like can say, well, this is how it's supposed to look. And then we just configure and we tweak from there. Um, so providing sort of a building block um, from an API standpoint is pretty valuable, I think, to to an agency. Yeah, I mean, we leverage it all the time. And I'd say almost all of our projects now use it in some way. Um, yeah. because we're able to do more. And that's where the really cool stuff like we can do happens. So um, merchants are snowflakes. They all want to be different, right? And, they, and I understand that. Like they're not, they're not here to, that's why they're, they're good at what they do is they, they want to be able to, to create experiences that really speak to their customers. Um, they have a vision and our job is not to say, okay, this is how you do it. And this is the only way to do it. Our job is to say like, hey, this is how we we would do it. Um, and then if you want to change that, it should be flexible. It should be testable, right? From yeah. an AD standpoint. Uh, and that vision should be able to be executed without it costing, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in terms of customization that, um, that has to be maintained over time, right? Yeah, I like the more that's easy for us to get up and running with because sure, we might be losing out on... Um, development hours in the early stage, but we're getting to market quicker with our brands and then we're able to drive results faster and then we're able to work on more with them that just, so we keep iterating versus, oh, it's going to be a ton of time and a ton of money to build out a bundling product for you. Now it's just like, hey, bundles is a part of our rollout strategy for a subscription program. And then what else can we do on top of it to make it custom for you? So the hours and the money are just coming in different places and it's actually um, I think it's m- much more effective than we're just going to have to build you the base functionality and then wait for the results to roll in. Yeah, the conversations I keep hearing, I keep hearing this trend and talking with merchants is that they're, they're very concerned about total cost of ownership, right, going in. I think some of the macroeconomic changes, particularly around um, sort of like uh, interest rates rising and some of the, the, the money that's out there and how the cost of money, if you will, 
Um, so there's like, there's a, a lot of focus on, you know, how do I um, get back to what I love, which is marketing, me doing media, growing my brand and doing less of, um, you know, the less of maintenance from a, from like maybe a customization standpoint, where maybe that equation was a little bit different 18 months ago. Um, and then the other I hear to your point is faster time to value. Like how do I enact a vision quickly, test it. And then if it, and then, you know, as they would say, pivot or preserve. Right. Uh, and I think that's, that's what merchants expect and they don't want to launch a project with, um, you know, with, without some semblance of being able to test it effectively and fast uh, to know whether or not it's working uh, before they decide whether or not they're going to move on. Yeah. And the lower investment, less effort, high ROI initiatives are definitely taking priority now. Um, it wasn't always that way, right? It used to be, yeah. you know, it, it was like, oh, I have this vision, let's build it. And then um, sort of, you know, just make it great. And, and I think now it's to the point where it's, it's, it needs to have a measurable ROI and that measurable ROI has to be quickly found out. Uh, yeah. I, I always joked, I, I was listening to a panel the other day where they were talking about whether or not they, it's the same concept. I think it, it actually is bleeding into like media uh, where someone was saying, well, if you really want to know whether or not your video is successful, put it on TikTok because you will know in two weeks whether or not that video was successful, whereas you wouldn't necessarily know it on you know, yeah. YouTube or like other attribution channels. And uh, I think they, they're they they're accustomed to that. They expect it. They, they put something out. They want to know whether or not it's successful in driving net new revenue for them uh, or it is actually having a measurable effect. And if um, and they don't want to wait six months to find that out. Right. Well, I think the we definitely still do testing across all of our merchants, but there's certain things now where we've done it for like 40 merchants for example, using Malomo to get the transactional emails and text over to Clavio and building out that experience. Yeah. Like we know without a doubt that doing that is going to have an ROI that's a positive. And we know if we add in additional personalization where you have separate experiences for one shot customers versus subscription at like a baseline level, that that'll produce an incremental ROI. So now we don't even bother with testing it. We just deploy that immediately. We immediately get the merchant onto that we immediately get them set up with the one-time subscription. And then we test from there. Like, what are some other ways that we can optimize this? But we already have the data. So why are we going to waste time with going with getting that value for the merchant when we know without a doubt that this is going to perform for them? This is ideal. It's like the perfect state, right? That's the yeah. that's why that's why everyone should work with electric, I think. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. There's, <laughs> the, there's the plug. Uh, well, what are some of the things you're seeing in terms of um how merchants are approaching subscriptions uh, this year, uh, especially given there's like a there's a trend towards membership, obviously as well. Uh, and and how do those two intersect? Yeah, so um, you know, I'll give an example, uh, uh, particularly around um, around wine, right? So uh, I know that that's a that's an interesting vertical um, in that it's sort of coming online in a, in a bigger way this year than maybe it ever has. Um, I know, like for example, you you have quite a few wine clients, Brandon, that you're you're seeing, um, and I think that's a good vertical to sort of explain the intersection of memberships and um, and bundles, mm -hmm. uh, where you know that in my mind you know, I think, I think I'm a product person. So I think in terms of like this product and this product, right. So we have a, a bundles product that recharge and we have a memberships product that recharge, but then the wine vertical, those two are synonymous with one another, right. Um, you may particularly, you may want to have a membership club. Uh, um, if you're a winery, for example, where people get access to particular types of, of wine, right. Or a particular subset or options, uh, within wine, that they may um, be able to, um, they may want to be part of this club in general, just so that they can buy the wine in the first place, right? And then you use the bundle product um, to pick those wines, to curate that bundle, um, to to create um, a sort of individualized experience for the customer. Um, so there's absolutely an intersection between those two. It's the concept of like buying a curated product um, on a regular or reoccurring basis, again, subscriptions at, or bundles, and then also the, uh, the opportunity to even buy that product through membership um, or being able to just have be in the club to buy it in the first place. So that's like the clearest way I can describe sort of the intersection. It's like there's a blurring of the lines of those products. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I, like, and it's, and we're seeing that not just in wine, but across all different verticals, right? Fashion, particularly, right? They may, they may yeah. want access or something to that effect. 
Yeah, I think, and uh, especially for wine, like we literally wouldn't be able to service that market without that offering um, because of how integral it is to the customer experience, having membership club and bundles, because all three are integrated in the way that you sort of laid out there, um, which it wouldn't make sense to be using different solutions for that when they're so innately tied together. Yeah. And that, that's really what we're seeing. Like we, you know, we, we've gone into those spaces. I mean, recharge this core offering has, has been, um, you know, a subscription product, but what we're finding is that those lines are starting to blur between memberships, between bundles, between recurring commerce uh, or subscriptions. Uh, and that's why I think we're, see you're seeing us come out with more varieties of those products is, is, our, is to support our merchants in that way. Right. And to optimize every touch point along that journey. Um, be it, you know, the, the membership payment, the, what, the, what, what they get as part of that membership, how it's presented to the merchant, how they select what they're buying um, from a bundle standpoint, um, all the way to checkout. Yeah. I guess in terms of um, what you're seeing from more of a uh, investment side of things, both in the, the tech partner space, agency partner, brands, what are people focusing on this year that might be different uh, compared to last year? Well, I think they're, they're putting a lot of effort into, um, well, first and foremost, just coming off this, uh, this, this conference, this panel I watched um, and it, it, I think they're putting a lot of effort into advertising number one. So like really thinking through um, the channels that they're putting their, their time and effort into and like how, valuable and how well presented that content is. So the, the line that stood out to me um, from, the, from this panel was that they, uh, this panel was at a, a company called um, Triple Whale. Triple Whale is called the Whaleys. It was in Austin last week yep. uh, or two weeks ago rather. And the line that they really stood out to me was that they said, you know, now e-commerce companies are having to become media companies, essentially. And the, the fact that they sell a product is sort of like a nice to have. Uh, which I think is interesting. Um, I told this story to some colleagues of mine and uh, one of them popped up and said, hey, I actually, that, that clicked for me because I just bought a burger from Beast Burger and I had no idea that that was even associated with the, the guy, Mr. Beast, right? Uh, which is, yeah, who knew we had a burger company, right? And apparently he has a lot of uh, D2C brands as well that are associated with it. So they're leveraging that sort of media content to go out and, and sell um, to sell their products. So I think that's number one, uh, is just like focusing on like building out really strong content because the advertising game has changed. Yeah. Uh, and then num number, and then the second one would be just like continually like optimizing their portfolios. Right. So like CRO is, is a hot topic right now. Just the, op the uh, conversion optimization is a, is a hot topic because they're very concerned that once they drive, they're spending all this time and effort and content that once they drive those merchants to, uh, excuse me, those customers to their site, that that customer journey is really, really sound uh, and really smooth throughout um, that, that like, it's very important that they're able to test and understand what's working, what's working in a particular amount of time um, to, to bring value um, to them as fast as possible. Yeah. I think the, there's, there are different buckets of like the customer journey that need to be invested in. And there's obviously like the ads, how do you get them to the website? Then once they're on the website, how do you get them to actually convert? And then once they've gone through that, it's the whole post-purchase experience. There's really the three main components, I think, to any D to C experience. There's obviously like sub components to each one of those, but that's, if you had to make it as simple as possible, it's how do you get them to the website? How do you get them to buy? And then how do you keep them? Yeah. And, and I think it has a lot to do with the fact that there's just, there's just fewer people shopping online than there were 18 months ago. Right. I mean, it's um, people have gone back to shopping on in physical stores again, uh, maybe a little faster than we, we thought, um, you know, Amazon's, I think they just had their first unprofitable quarter since, uh, since 2014. Um, so, and their, their e-commerce revenue was flat year over year. So I think um, that now the, mer the people who are out there shopping online, they have a certain level of expectation, right? Their customers are, there are fewer customers out there than there were, um, uh, you know, a little while ago during the pandemic. And those customers that are there have a really, um, have a really high expectation of what that journey should look like. And they will find it one way or the other. Yeah. Well, I think that's why you see 
well, I think the investments were made by companies like Shopify, for example, that were betting on a continuity of the e-commerce boom. And right. sure, it's going to continue to grow, but not at the rate that it did. And so it just has to be reset a little bit. And I think we'll see those companies become profitable again in, in relatively short order. But the trend, and there was some piece that I was reading about um, the way like Gen Z is shopping. And sure, they might be uh, all over TikTok. And like, that's the number one world search platform now against Google. Like people use TikTok yeah. to look up like restaurants and things near me and stuff like that, which I found fascinating. But even though there's so much digital adoption, it's like something like 50% of Gen Z prefers shopping in person because it's more experiential. There's certain ways that like certain senses that just get triggered, obviously. Yeah. In person that can't be, that you can't do that online. So Shopify's investments in like the POS system and POS Go and making it easier for merchants to be able to sell in person, but still have that integrated commerce experience because that's what the customers expect. But I, I want to get more and more of our brands to think about how they can do pop-up shops and in-person yeah. events and activations because you can just look in Shopify and see what your top markets are, then go into Klaviyo and create a segment of based off of zip code radius or whatever. Here's your group to go invite. And then it's a community event. You can drive sales. You can get referrals that way. It's some customer acquisition. And you're getting a bunch of UGC too that you wouldn't be getting otherwise. Um, I think that's important. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's it's a it's a great point. I think merchants are just be like, they're doing cost benefit analysis, you know, again, at, at a point uh, in time, uh, you know, so, uh, maybe a year, a year and a half ago, it was able to take what in effect was cheap money and pump it into Facebook uh, yeah. or a social channel. And, you know, you were able to sort of guarantee or use third-party data in order to go out and, and acquire new customers. And since that got more expensive, um, they can just do a cost benefit analysis against, against that, against, of having a physical location, right? There's a cost that incurs with having a physical location versus doing digital advertising. And in some cases, yeah, to your point, the uh, pop-up shops are more profitable and more effective in some places uh, yeah. than um, doing some of the advertising that, that once maybe was well, uh, more cost effective. You can look at it as like a customer acquisition cost. I was talking with a, a merchant. It, it wasn't pop-up shops. They were doing legitimate retail stores, but they were basically taking the retail stores. And because they have an integrated POS with Shopify, uh, the e-commerce backend, they're able to see who are customers in this store that are incremental, like net new versus who are returning. And the, the way they're doing it is like, let's say the retail store costs 10 grand for that month. Then they're going to yeah. see how many uh, customers, new ones they got through that retail store. Maybe it's 500. And then they get like a customer acquisition cost through the retail store. So they're looking at it as a, as a lever to drive customer acquisition because everything's going into the same system. And then you're getting the email and SMS communications and it's just a really synergistic customer experience. I think that is pretty interesting. And the more I think about it, the more I enjoy shopping from brands who at least have some sort of like in-store presence because it gives you that optionality too when it comes to returns. If you want to go to the mall, hang out, do whatever, it's, it's more of that integrated experience. Yeah, and you're right. It's more intimate too. I think, you know, the, the, I've, I heard a, a presentation from the founder of Movement Watches one time, and he, he gave a really great line that always stu stuck with me, which was like, find the, the smallest um, ecosystem that can sustain you as a merchant. And I think like, you, and he, he made a point about how you need to look like that ecosystem, dress like that ecosystem, sort of understand that community, right? Yeah. And I think having a physical location like really it, it personifies that, but it also makes you closer to your customer and closer to that community um, so that they can, they feel like they're going to have a more intimate experience with you. And our mission is to try and figure out like, okay, if you're going to take the investment of, of doing 10 grand to do a pop-up store, how, and you're going to have someone, you know, come in and, and, uh, and buy something, how do you take that customer from like that physical experience and keep them? From like an online experience, you know, month over month over month, right? So maybe even that's like a concept of subscribing to something while you're in the store, right? Uh, subscribing, like you can buy a product that you really like, and maybe it's a skincare product or something to that effect. You get to try it there, you liked it there, and then you're able to subscribe to it right there from a physical aspect, and then you just now yeah. you've got that customer month over month, um, and you're getting some more LTV. 
I'm excited for the subscription API updates that they're going to do for the POS so that you can like sell subscriptions in person and the in-person, like in-person sales is so much easier than uh, online. Sure. It's one-to-one. -one, you're not like doing it at scale, but the ability to talk to somebody, interpret their body language, get all the signals back and forth, be able to connect with them and then inform like product recommendations that can't be beat. Uh, and cannot be matched when it comes to online. So the stores that are able to have like, and think about investing in having a strong sort of retail experience with the employees. And um, it was just sort of fascinating going through additions and seeing how integrated the, the two are and that sometimes now like retail store employees will like text with their customers or they're sending them online orders and they're just coordinating things. And you like, it's not enough to just be able to, I think they're up-leveling the requirements that go into a retail position that historically might've been thought of as uh, maybe not as I don't know, high end of a job or whatever the term would be, but now there's a lot of emphasis around that customer experience in person and how it plays out in improving the LTV of that customer. Yeah, it's sort of reversed, didn't it? It, it was like four years ago, it was, hey, everything's going to be bought online and then picked up from a store. And then the physical location was going to become a, just like a like a corresponding like pickup point or something. And they were happy to have that because they'd get them in the store. But I think the customer journey now is, to your point, going to start at the store, right? It's going to start in some of those like high traffic locations. And then they're going to be transitioned to a more digital experience um, post that which is really exciting to see because you'll know that customer, you'll have more data points on that customer um, in order to like give them a better online experience versus just having your retail store just become this sort of correspondence pickup location. Yeah, if I wanted to start an e-commerce brand, which I definitely don't right now, I'm not envious of anybody starting an e-commerce brand right now, but if I Here did, <laughs> I would start it in person. Like I'd pick a location in like a hometown or something and use that as my hub for building out the community, like doing my customer acquisition, because I think it's also important too for the founder to get to talk to those first customers and start to build out what that community and, and experience really is going to be like. And I also think that's why more and more of the successful brands I'm seeing are very founder oriented or founder led, or maybe the founder has like a strong social presence or the founder is just very much so innately a part of the a story behind why the product was founded or why the company was started. It's less of a, um, like you don't see anybody really starting, I don't think, companies where it's faceless. Uh, there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a lot of faces associated with brands now, and those are the most successful ones because of the authenticity that it provides and breathes into the company. Well, people, you know, I think that's like a human trait, right? We want to um, to tend to sort of be around people like us, right? We tend to be around like a community, right? So you you don't want to necessarily feel like you're buying from some faceless corporation. You want to feel like you're buying from someone who understands you, um, understands your community, um, understands sort of like the way, again, this goes kind of goes back to like the idea of making sure that you got to find a community that sustains you. You need to Need to, to look like them, be one of them. If you're not, they'll, they'll sniff that out and they'll know that it's inauthentic uh, and they'll gravitate towards brands that do sort of have that authenticity. Yeah. I think the consumer's BS detector or BS radar is at an all-time high. So yeah, that, I know. I mean, it, I, I always, you know, it's funny you mentioned like if you were going to start an e-commerce brand today, like if I was going to do that, I would look and see like what communities exist that aren't being served, right? That I'm part of. Uh, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of people on subreddits, you know, that are out there that um, that will tell you exactly where the gaps are and like, why doesn't this exist? Um, and look for those opportunities versus, um, you know, trying to find some something you can import from China and sell on a, a yeah. site. We should uh, start a subreddit uh, incubator. Just go there through go. Reddit, have some sort of algorithm crawl through there, pick out the best ideas and let's just. So let's get rolling. Just run with that. Yeah, exactly. And go go find the go find the founders that are in there who want to solve those problems and invest in them, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Is there any sort of last like uh, tips, tricks you want to give anybody listening, things that they should be thinking about? Really, really anything. Yeah. Um, well, I'll bring it back to to just what I see and breathe every day, which is recurring commerce, right? I, I think um I think merchants, the only thing I would say is I think merchants really need to think about like every single touch point uh, in your journey, like in your customer journey, 
Like, where does it start? Not only from the content sort of advertising standpoint, um, but like once they hit your website, once they hit that landing page, um, all the way to, um, to when it, the item is delivered on their door, um, think through um, how that experience relates back to your brand. Um, and that's, that's really, I think, will serve any merchant well uh, as they're trying to sort of navigate this more competitive landscape that we find ourselves in. No, I couldn't agree more. Well, where can people find you online? Um, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find me just my Kevin Klein at Recharge. Um, I'm also, uh, my handle is Kevin M. Klein on, on Twitter. Uh, you can find me there uh, and certainly look for me. Uh, I'm going to be speaking um, at Tripoli, Miami. I think you're speaking at that event as well, Brendan. So um, I'll be in Miami directly. Uh, I don't know if this is going to air before then, but um, find me on the speaking circuit. I'll always post where I'm going <laughs> to speak around. Um, I'll also be at Shop Talk later in the month uh, of March. So just keep an eye out. I'm happy to talk subscription recurring commerce with you anytime. Yeah, I think we actually, we might be back to back. So yeah, there you go. Joint presentation. So that well, sounds fun. Hopefully, hopefully you don't do, you're actually going before me. So oh, you know, well, big expectations for me. Right. I think I might be going first, which that might be like the best, either the best or worst position. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't, probably the best. Probably the best. Because if you go last, I mean, I don't know. You have to live up to everything that's come before. People might be a little bit tired. I don't know. Yeah. They got to get some good energy in the room. Going first. I think I went, I spoke at that event last year and I went sort of in the middle. And uh, yeah, watching all those presentations the entire time was definitely um, a, a thing to see. And I'm trying to live up to some of the great speakers that were there uh, was a challenge. Well, people will be re will fresh for you because it's only a one day event. So it's not like it's a two day event and then everybody's going to be rolling in an hour late to the event because of the uh, extra clicker activities the night before. So you're going to be set up. Everybody's going to be ready. And I'm, then... I'm ready. I'm ready. I learned from a friend of mine who's also speaking at that event. His name is Phil Jackson, um, that you should clap for yourself when you walk on stage. It's the first thing they teach you in MC training. Uh, really? it, gives, it gives the, uh, gives the audience uh, license to clap for you. So pro tip. Hmm. All right. Well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to emulate everything that you do on your way up to this. <laughs> you don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, excited for that. Um, for everybody listening, thanks for listening. As always, this is Brandon Amoroso. You can find me at brandonamoroso.com or electricmarketing.com. Uh, and we will see you next time. Okay.